Welcome to the Robert C. Byrd Center for Congressional History and Education's 18th Annual Tommy Moses Memorial Lecture on the U.S. Constitution. I'm Ray Smock, the Center's Interim Director. The Byrd Center is located in historic Shepherdstown, West Virginia, on the campus of Shepherd University. This lecture series was launched in 2005 by the late Senator Robert C. Byrd of West Virginia and is named for the late Tom E. Moses, founder of the Eastern Panhandle American Civil Liberties Union, a decorated medical paratrooper in World War II, and an active citizen for civil rights and civil liberties all his life. He exemplifies the kind of citizen James Madison had in mind if democracy was to flourish. We thank the Moses family for their support that makes possible this premiere Constitution Day event. Now to introduce our speaker. If you follow national politics, you already know Norm Ornstein. He has been one of the most insightful and respected analysts of Congress and the American political system for almost a half a century. He came to D.C. And, as a congressional fellow in uh, 1969 and never left. He and his longtime colleague, Tom Mann, built reputations for scrupulous nonpartisanship and an equally scrupulous pro-institutional stance. They didn't just study government, they worked to make it better by helping to create the Office of Compliance to see that Congress follows the same laws that affect us all, an independent House Office of Congressional Ethics, and they worked on the Campaign Finance Reform Act as well. Norm is a senior scholar emeritus at the American Enterprise Institute, the author of best-selling books on politics, who is seen frequently on national television as a commentator and campaign analyst. He is a contributing editor and columnist for The Atlantic. He holds a Ph.D. in political science from the University of Michigan. This is his second visit to the Bird Center, and we are honored to welcome him back to talk about threats to American democracy and the Constitution. We're barely eight weeks away from uh, an election that uh, I could argue, you know, we always do, every election is the most significant in our lifetimes. I could make a case that this one might just be that. And we don't know where we're going. And we don't know where we're going with so many elements of where we are in our society and in our political process. But I wanna start with the tagline here, which is having been in Washington now for more than 50 years and immersed in our politics and knowing, having the privilege of knowing a very large share of the players, the elected ones, the others who served in important positions, I have never been more frightened for the future of my country. And I believe that we face the biggest crisis in our constitutional system and possibly more broadly in our society uh, since the Civil War. And I do not believe that that is hyperbole or any kind of exaggeration. Now, what I'd like to do is first to step back and look at some of the larger trends that have put us in this position, because it's not just a threat to the fundamentals of the Constitution. It's that, but it's also something deeper. And the first trend is now, it's now become apparent to people in a way that uh, even though Tom and I sounded an alarm for a long time, uh, did not become apparent to many. And frankly, one of the troubles we have is it is still not apparent to a very large share of those in our media uh, who continue to stubbornly resist uh, any of the things that point out what the real dangers are. <clears throat> But that's the political tribalism that we now are enduring. Now, you know, most of the commentary, most of the scholarly analysis even, uh, has referred to this and continues to refer to this as polarization. And there's no question we have political polarization. When I came to Washington in 1969, the two parties were very different than they are now. Uh, you know, the Congressional Quarterly, the venerable publication, had as one of its key voting elements the votes for the conservative coalition, 
which was a group that was Democrats and Republicans sort of in the center right of the process who tended to have a dominant role. But it was because the two parties were broad coalitions, very different. Back then, not quite half, but almost half of the Democrats who made up a majority that in the House was enduring for 40 years, 24 years when I got there, uh, or 16 years, I should say, when I got there, uh, was uh, these Southern conservative Democrats. We used to call them bull weevils for that insect that infects cotton in the South. Uh, and that enabled the Democrats with the rest of the party, non-Southern, mostly urban liberals uh, and moderates, to have that majority. But it was a very different party. And the Republican Party had maybe 25, 30% who we used to call gypsy moths or that bug that infects hardwood trees in New England and the Northeast. And that's the Margaret Chase Smiths and Mark Hatfields uh, and Tom Kekels, uh, who were moderates and liberals. And that, of course, has changed. It's long gone. And as our parties changed, and regionally we saw dramatic uh, changes in the bases of the two parties, they became more co uh, cohesive and homogeneous. Uh, and that's polarization. But that's different from tribalism. You know, two of the people I became close to over years in the Senate were Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy. And you couldn't find two more different people, different in their upbringings, different in their lifestyles, very different in their political views. But we wouldn't have a children's health insurance program if it weren't for the two of them working together because they looked at each other and said, you're a great person. You're deeply misguided in what you believe, but we know there's a problem here, and we have an obligation to try to work together, and you're a patriot, and we'll find ways, common ground, and then doing some horse trading. Now, it's very different. You wouldn't see the modern equivalent of a Ted Kennedy or an Orrin Hatch, and Orrin Hatch anchored the right wing of his own party back then. He would anchor the left wing of his party now, but the fact is, instead of looking at people on the other side of the aisle as honorable if misguided, now they're the enemy who are trying to destroy our way of life. And that's a very different dynamic. And what that means is, for the most part, if you try to work with people on the other side of the aisle, you are in effect aiding and abetting the enemy. And what we know is that while this started in Washington, and as we were talking earlier tonight, I would attribute the move to tribalism more to Newt Gingrich than to anybody else, along with the rise of tribal media and then social media. Uh, but the fact is it's now metastasized to the states and to the country as a whole. And it is a cancer on a political system, because especially a political system like ours, where baked into the constitutional system is almost the necessity that you have to find broad leadership coalitions. You know, I used to, one of my great friends and mentors was Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and Moynihan had as one of his adages that we don't do significant social policy in this country without broad bipartisan consensus because it's part of our political system. We're not a parliamentary system where the society understands that the majority is going to make policy. And if you don't like it, it's still legitimate policy, and you're going to have an opportunity in three, four, or five years to throw them out and bring in others who will alter that policy. That's not how we work. We have not a parliament where, you know, which comes from the French parlay to speak. You've all seen question period, because it's government made, uh, policy made by a government, and the majority reflexively goes along. And the opportunity for the minority is to scream at them and try and hold them to account in their question period. Congress, of course, comes from the Latin meaning coming together. And the whole idea was you would get disparate people from this vast republic that we have speaking, communicating, debating, deliberating face to face and organically come to an agreement that the public would accept, not because the political system said the majority says do this and we're going to do it, but because it had a legitimacy built in through that process of debate and deliberation 
coalition building and compromise. You cannot do that in a tribal environment. And of course, a tribal environment also means that you weaponize your politics. And anything becomes justified if you're keeping evil people from destroying your way of life. It's war. Now, we used to think of politics as war without violent means. Tribalized politics can mean war with violent means. And that's a danger that we face, and now we've seen it play out as we saw it play out with the violence of the insurrection, and we've seen it in other places. And frankly, if you watched even the slightest amount of Trump's chilling rally in Ohio just this week, which I tweeted, uh, it's too bad that Lenny Riefenstahl was not around to film it. But uh, the fact is that Trump has gone from just calling the press the enemy of the people to calling everybody who opposes him, including judges, the Justice Department, and others, the enemy of the people. We know what happens to those who are the enemy of the people. We know that it was a phrase popularized by Stalin, and we know that Khrushchev, uh, when he took power, said we are not gonna use that phrase because it's way too dangerous. But that's the kind of world we have to cope with now. And what we see is in our politics, as well. Campaigns, in many cases, don't matter anymore. It doesn't matter if you have candidates who wouldn't stand up to the kind of scrutiny that an election campaign is supposed to bring, where you look at candidates and you say, this person I don't really agree with much or clearly not qualified to be representing a large group of people. Now it is much more one of us or one of them. And voting for one of them now means that you're aiding and abetting those who are trying to destroy your way of life. And we know from a lot of the research done in political science that voters are motivated more now by what the scholars call negative partisanship than anything else. Namely, you want to make sure that those evil people don't get into power more than you are with an affinity to your own party or with even a broader look at who would be best uh, with character and other qualities to serve in public life. Now, the second broader trend that we need to be aware of and focused on is the economic inequality in the country, which has grown significantly uh, over the last 50 years. It's always an issue. You're always going to have a situation where you have rich people and not rich people, haves and have-nots, a part of what the political process is supposed to do is to find ways at least to create those opportunities for those who don't have to be able to move up the ladder. But we also know that the inequality now is greater than it was in Juan Perón's Argentina. And we know, I mean, just to pick a couple of examples, uh, from 1978 to 2018, 40 years, pay of CEOs in businesses grew over 1,000%. Worker pay grew 11.9%. Uh, the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of Americans hold as much wealth as the bottom 80%. And it's not just income inequality, it's wealth inequality that matters here. And we know that those at the very, very, very top, including especially the hedge fund managers and others who are making staggering sums of money and are very conspicuous in their consumption of it, exacerbate all of this. Now that's not just a problem because we don't want to see people fall behind. It's a problem because when you get that kind of economic inequality, one, it breeds a kind of populism that can have some very positive elements. It's always been a part of American culture, but it also has pernicious elements and it encourages the rise of demagogues, which is what we saw not just in Juan Perón's Argentina, but in many other countries, and we've seen it happen here as well. And that is generally getting worse and not better. The third phenomenon is what I would call the regional divide that we have, and it's related to some degree to the second one. And I don't just mean that we've divided into red states and blue states, which also goes against the grain of a constitution that gave enormous power to states but didn't expect that they themselves would be homogeneous internally in their own political views. 
you know, an, uh, the electoral college is supposed to work where candidates want to appeal broadly to try and bring in more of those votes. It's one of the ironies here. I digress a little bit, but when I saw Senator Kramer of North Dakota say, we could never get rid of the Electoral College, nobody would pay attention to North Dakota. And my response to that was, uh, excuse me, Senator Kramer, nobody does pay any attention to North Dakota. Why would a presidential candidate campaign in North Dakota, never mind the three electoral votes, it's a completely red state, and there would be no uh, impact in going there. Actually, if you had a national popular vote and you knew it was going to be very close, then those votes in North Dakota would matter. So he's exactly wrong about that. But that's not what I was talking about when I referred to a regional divide. What we're seeing now is stark differences within all of our states, red and blue, between the engines of economic prosperity the cities, the big cities, and the areas surrounding them, the suburbs surrounding them, and as you move further and further away from them to smaller towns, and then to the exurbs, the smaller towns, the rural areas, we're seeing stark differences. Two-thirds of our GDP comes from those major uh, uh, metropolitan areas. In a global economy, in a technologically driven world, it's going to be the places that have the infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure, the educational infrastructure, to be able to thrive and prosper. People with the education where they're going to be supple enough that in this world we live in, you're going to be able to move from job to job. And as you move further out, we see more economic stagnation, less ability to be able to compete, jobs that are disappearing, Nobody knows it better than this state, than the people in this state. And what we're seeing is a growing set of gaps that are different from the ones we saw before. Sure, we've got a generation gap uh, and a, uh, a, a gender gap, but we're seeing a diploma gap now. And the people who have college degrees, who have advanced degrees, who are able to thrive, are very different in their outlook and their political views than those who don't. We're seeing a religiosity gap. Religion is stronger as you move out to those exurban and rural areas. And of course, we see a racial gap that's exacerbated by all of that as well. And this sense, as you move away from those urban areas, that people have, as they've seen not just economic stagnation, but all of the social deterioration that comes with it, is a resentment of the elites that is a fuel for that kind of populism. If you go back to Donald Trump's success in 2016, a part of it was that he instinctively saw this and spoke to those people, even though he did nothing to improve their lot in life. And in fact, privately, of course, was contemptuous of them publicly was often contemptuous of them, but he spoke to them. And this sense that the elites, the arrogant, educated people look down on them and have contempt for them drove a lot of their behavior. And frankly, you can carry that forward and see it play out in the way we've dealt with the pandemic. People who refused to get vaccinated, who refused to stay masked because it was these uh, elites telling them. And again, I'll take it back to Newt. One of the first things Newt did when he became speaker, other than fire the best historian we've had in the House of Representatives, <laughs> was to get rid of the Office of Technology Assessment. That was the beginning of the war on science. And you can be sure that the war on science, which has expanded dramatically, is also very much connected to this kind of divide. It's the elites telling people who are struggling, here's what you've got to do, and we know and you don't. And when you get a demagogue who can appeal to them, it can lead to very bad things. Now the fourth, which is very relevant to the subject of this lecture, is the structural weaknesses that we have in our political system that are growing more and more real and more and more difficult. And here I will say, if we never had a Donald Trump, 
if we didn't have some of these immediate challenges that we face, we would still be heading towards a dramatic crisis and legitimacy in our political system that is only going to grow deeper and bigger. And I'll, uh, look, let's face it, the reality is the Constitution that was put together as much as a, a pragmatic document as anything else. How are you going to get enough states to do a constitution to ratify it? How can you figure out ways in which you can create this balance that meant bending over doubly and triply backwards to give more power to states? But that was all done at a time when the ratio of population between the smallest and largest states was about 10 or 12 to 1. And now it's 70 to 1. And what we've seen is the shifts in population over time have created an even greater imbalance. I'll give you the one figure that is, to me, the most troubling, which is that we are almost at a point in the society where 70% uh, of Americans will live in just 15 of our 50 states. Now, it's not a surprise. Those are the states that are the engines of economic growth. Those 15 states represent more than two-thirds of our GDP. People move there because the jobs are there. And they're not moving to North Dakota. And they're not moving to some of the other states. Now, think about what that means. And to take it even a little bit further, 50% of Americans will live in only eight of our states. That means that the Electoral College gets even more skewed. You could look at the 44 elections from the time when we first began to actually count popular votes, 1824, all the way through uh, 1996. And you could argue that there were one or two where it was clear that the winner of the popular vote lost the presidency. Since then, we've had two, and we're going to have more. And every time you have an election where the winner of the presidency loses the popular vote. You chip away at the fundamental legitimacy. We know that in 2000, which was in many ways the limiting case, uh, at least as much as any other election in our history, 36 days to decide it. The winner of the popular vote by a half a million, Al Gore, ended up losing basically on a five to four partisan vote in the Supreme Court. But in part because Al Gore very graciously conceded, and in part because we hadn't seen this before, the public reaction more generally was, hey, somebody's got to decide, and those are the rules. And you know, it's like in a tennis match. It's not how many games you win, it's how many sets. You have to use the rules. The second time Hillary Clinton lost by three million votes and lost the presidency, and the public reaction was not quite uh, as filled with equanimity. This last time, of course, Donald Trump lost by 7 million votes, and yet wasn't that far from being able to cobble together an electoral majority, but of course, even with that, he uh, still says that the election was stolen. But think about what happens the third time, or the fourth time, or the fifth time, that somebody potentially loses the popular votes by 10 million and still prevails and becomes president. That legitimacy that comes with an election gets devastated. Now, as bad or worse than that is the reality that if 70% of Americans live in 15 states, that means that 30% of Americans will elect 70 senators. More than enough to override a veto, more than enough whatever kind of filibuster you have, and it's not that all of those states are red states and the uh, 15 are blue states. There's a mix, obviously. We have a Delaware and a Maine, uh, among others. You have a Texas and a Florida and the big states. But the fact is that the 30% who will elect that supermajority in the Senate do not represent the diversity of the country and will represent it even less as we grow more diverse. And they don't represent the economic dynamism of the country. And increasingly, what that means is that the whole notion of a republic, a republic that, as Ben Franklin famously said, if you can keep it, 
is, and that so many people out there, especially those on the right, say, uh, we don't have a democracy, we have a republic, without any understanding of what that means in the Constitution. A republic means that voters elect representatives, and those representatives represent them. What happens when you vote and they don't represent you? What kind of legitimacy will exist? And increasingly what that means is that the 30% are going to demand more and more money, among other things, from the 70%. And that alone will erode the legitimacy of the system. Then you throw in the House of Representatives. And remember, at the Constitutional Convention, there was some discussion about whether terms should be one year so that they could be even closer to the people. This is the body that is supposed to really represent public views, where there will be other checks and balances to keep emotions from boiling over and uh, enacting policy without thinking it through, with radical partisan gerrymandering, with racial gerrymandering layered on top of it, and with the problem that exists. And remember, the House is not perfectly representative in any case. It also has a bias towards smaller states, because every state gets at least one. And if you're thinking about a contested presidential election, boy, does that matter, since if nobody gets a majority of electoral votes, every one of those states gets one vote. Uh, so that matters. But increasingly, people are voting for representatives, and they're not getting represented. And of course, more and more of those districts are homogeneous. They are tilting us towards more extreme candidates. And again, if you have a political system that is a democracy and a Republican form of democracy, fundamental to its legitimacy is that you have free and fair elections and people vote and believe whether they win or lose that the outcome is a legitimate one, and therefore the policies that will flow are themselves legitimate. Now, layered onto that is another problem with the legitimacy of the system, which is that even though Democrats have won the popular vote in the presidency for, if I'm not mistaken, seven of the last eight times, we have a Supreme Court that in no way reflects that broader viewpoint, including justices who will be there for four or five decades after they came to office when the electorate will be dramatically different. And even though they're not like elected representatives, the legitimacy of the court also depends on it broadly reflecting the interests of the society. And what we have seen, of course, is that even as our political institutions and our public have tribalized, the Supreme Court has tribalized. If you saw any of or read about Justice Sam Alito's speech in Rome, it was, in effect, a middle finger to a public saying, we, you don't, whether you like what we did or not, that's too bad. Whether you think we based it on principles of judicial prudence or constitutional thinking or not, we've got the votes, screw you. And that, which of course is now reflected in a series of decisions, including most famously and recently the Dobbs one, but going back, the Citizens United decision, the Shelby County decision, the Brnovich decision, and others that flowed from it, reflect more naked political power than they do with the kind of jurisprudence we would expect from a Supreme Court. And a legitimacy undermined, of course, by what happened to Merrick Garland, by the fact that uh, Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed eight days before a presidential election in contravention of the pledges made by uh, Lindsey Graham and many others and what they would do. Uh, it creates another obstacle to this broad sense of the public, if we had any broad sense, that the system is on the up and up. That's where we are. And now just let me turn to a couple of minutes about where we might be headed. And let me say my biggest, I have a bunch of fears. We all have a bunch of fears. I fear the kind of violence that could take place. 
and the sectarian violence. Uh, I don't know how many of you have managed to see the first installment of this majestic Ken Burns, Lynn Novick documentary on the Holocaust and America's response to it. Uh, but it itself is chilling. And you realize, uh, not just from Germany, from what happened in the former Yugoslavia, from what we've seen in so many places, that if a society begins to divide into enemy camps, sectarian violence often follows, and it can get very, very bad. So there's that. <clears throat> I look at Iran DeSantis out there, and I look at the fact that the Conservative Political Action Committee, CPAC, held its meeting last year, or earlier this year, I should say, in Budapest, honoring Viktor Orban, and then had Viktor Orban come to their meeting in Dallas, where he was met by Ron DeSantis, Greg Abbott, and a host of others who are going to be the ones running for the Republican nomination for president. And it's pretty clear to me that the model that they have in mind is not Russia and Putin. It's Hungary and Orban. And what do we have there? What we have in Hungary is a Potemkin village of a democracy. It's a structure of elections that on the surface seem like real elections. But in fact, they're rigged. They are genuinely rigged. And there's no way that Orban and his party can lose. They have what looks like an independent and legitimate court system and judiciary. But in fact, there is no way that it will ever come up with a decision that doesn't reflect the interests of Orban and his cronies. They have a surface free press. But every time an entity, a television station, a newspaper, a magazine, goes against the ruling power, they either get hit with a tax bill that puts them out of business or end up with their leaders in jail on some trumped up charges. And we have to fear that possibility. It doesn't happen overnight, it's a slide moving in that direction. And it can happen because of a whole series of decisions that take away even more the legitimacy of a political system. Now I'm worried in the short term as well because of what we face in just about eight weeks. Now, we don't know what's going to happen, and lots of things can happen between now and then. Frankly, if I'd given this lecture two weeks ago, I would have talked about the danger of a rail strike that could blow up the economy and the supply chain in the short run that has now been averted. But there are many things that can happen that can alter uh, outcomes. Having said that, we also know that if I'd been here six months ago, we probably would have been talking about a Republican landslide akin to what happened in the first Obama midterm, where Republicans won more seats in the House than they had in 100 years and took the majority. We're not there now in significant part because of the Dobbs decision. And we don't know where we're going. There's a pretty strong possibility that Democrats can retain a majority in the Senate, but not as much uh, of a possibility of keeping a majority in the House, where it's already razor thin. And right now, almost every analyst would say that the odds are exceedingly high that Republicans will win a majority in the House, even if it's a slender one. Now, why is that so alarming, especially given that we have a long history of divided government? 538.com has done an analysis of candidates. And they have found that 126 Republican candidates for the House who have a 95% or greater chance of winning are election deniers. will say flat out that Trump won in 2020, or will say, we can't be sure, but Joe Biden's not legitimate. Now, 218 make a majority. They're not likely to have 250. Maybe they get 225. Either way, that means a majority of the majority in the House, if they win, are election deniers. And it's not just one thing. That is a pretty good leading indicator of a broader radicalism. 
And we know from what many of these candidates have pledged and said what they have in mind. Now, it's not that they can unilaterally pass legislation that, for example, would make abortion illegal all across the country, or that they can remove Joe Biden or Merrick Garland or others from office. They can impeach with a simple majority. They can't convict uh, in the Senate. But there's a lot of power there. And it's not just the power to do investigations. If you saw a piece in the New York Times just a couple of days ago, Kevin McCarthy is already planning this host of investigations, dozens on Hunter Biden, but others on, uh, in fact, Jim Jordan, uh, who would be chair of the Judiciary Committee, has already said publicly, Merrick Garland, if I'm the chair of the Judiciary Committee, you can forget about doing anything other than turning over every document you have and testifying continuously in front of us. But it's also that the big power that exists in Congress in one house is a veto power, and that's the power of the purse. You can block spending, and you can, as we saw when Republicans took a majority in the Tea Party fueled election in 2010, try to use the debt ceiling as a hostage to accomplish your demands. And we know those demands that include getting rid of uh, Alejandro Mayorkas, the head of the uh, Department of Homeland Security, and Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, and a host of uh, others who are in uh, office. And it includes demanding no further investigations into the affairs of Donald Trump. Now, in 2010 and into 2011, egged on by then House Majority Leader Eric Cantor and Majority Whip Kevin McCarthy, and fueled by uh, people like uh, Jason Chaffetz, the Tea Party radicals, we came within an inch of uh, breaching the debt ceiling. Uh, John Boehner, who was speaker, and Mitch McConnell, who recognized what that would do, including to their own brand, saved us in the end. What we also know is that a lot of analysts showed that just by getting so close, it raised borrowing costs and probably was an extra $18 billion in interest that taxpayers had to pay because of the fandango that we went through. Jason Chaffetz said afterwards, we weren't kidding around. We would take us right over the cliff. Now, Chaffetz and his allies were not the majority of their own party even at that point. A couple of years after that, they created the Freedom Caucus. Now, I was around in 1973 when uh, we saw the creation of something called the Republican Study Committee. That became, Ray knows that well, became the right-wing caucus of the Republican Party trying to pull the party more in a conservative direction. It started small, but by 2000, they had a majority of the Republicans in the House. The right-wing caucus, the Freedom Caucus formed because the right-wing caucus wasn't right-wing enough. Right now, the Freedom Caucus itself has about 45 declared members. There are others who haven't declared it. And it's kind of a rogues gallery. It's the Jim Jordans and Marjorie Taylor Greens and Lauren Boberts and Matt Gateses of the House. I would almost guarantee you that the Freedom Caucus, if it is not replaced by something that believes the Freedom Caucus isn't tough enough, will have a majority. And their willingness to push us over the cliff with a leader who wouldn't be able to stop them, even if he wanted to, is palpable and great. A default would be just absolutely catastrophic, the full faith and credit of the United States. But imagine if we get not just a government shutdown, but disruptions in spending if we have investigations that cripple agencies, and if we have a gridlock in policy where you can't do much of anything to deal with the serious problems we have in the country, forcing executive action, if anything is gonna take place, but a Supreme Court that has already signaled when it said to the EPA, you don't really have the power to regulate clean air. And when it's said to the Centers for Disease Control, you don't really have the power 
to implement public health regulations in the middle of a pandemic and has indicated that there are five votes or maybe six to eliminate the Chevron Doctrine, which is the one that says that agencies, if they follow the Administrative Procedures Act and do their due diligence and hold hearings and handle it in, with the regular order, can make regulations to implement policy as crises or challenges emerge that aren't dealt with specifically in legislation. That it's part of the executive branch's ability to make sure the laws are faithfully executed. Do away with that, something that was long championed by Antonin Scalia, for example. Knowing that Congress can't act and intervene. In this instance, Congress at least was able in the reconciliation package to put in specific language giving EPA some authority to deal with some of these climate change issues. But that could go away entirely. We have a crippled government. I will say with full confidence, this is not what the framers had in mind. For all the flaws of what they built in, flaws that make it harder to make policy, that move us further away from real representation in the country, it's a political system that could still figure out ways to work. And we're moving away from the ability to figure out those ways to work. Now, I'll just make one last comment here, which is constitutions matter, laws matter, rules matter. They are the exoskeleton of a political system in a society. But it's the norms of behavior that are the tendons and the ligaments and the sinews that keep the whole thing from collapsing. And as big a problem, maybe bigger than the fact that the skeleton is increasingly wobbly, is that the norms have been shattered. And we see that obviously with election denial, with the attempts to undermine the system, with the contempt for the regular order, with the way in which Mitch McConnell handled the Supreme Court confirmations joined by his colleagues with the fact that the filibuster, which for decades operated under the same rules as it did until the Obama years, but did not cause the system to move to gridlock because people agreed to a set of norms that you only used it under extraordinary circumstances that suddenly had those norms shattered where it was used simply as a weapon of mass obstruction. Lose the norms and they're even harder to bring back than the structures. And I'll end with another phrase from my friend and mentor, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, in a seminal piece that he wrote called Defining Deviancy Down. When you start to lose those norms, the new normal is abnormal. But it's accepted because that's the way things are. And we have a press corps that is bought into that and refuses to call out bad behavior that violates norms, or to point fingers at those who are genuinely violating them in a manic effort to maintain a balance that is itself creating even more of a danger to where we're headed. So have a nice day, uh, <laughs> or have a nice night, as it is. And I am open to questions and comments, yeah, including uh, those from the Zoom audience. Um, I'll get a, I'll get a, uh, yeah, we'll take them here, and then uh, Jody will also uh, monitor yeah. for those on Zoom, and we'll take a couple there. And if you'll raise your hand so everybody can hear the question, Jody will get a microphone over to you on that side, and I'll get you one on this side. Thank you very much for that very hopeful <laughs> presentation. I have a friend who uh, says to me that he thinks we need to have a new constitutional convention. And I say, whoa, wait a second, uh, the bad guys will 
go crazy and, and introduce all sorts of issues that are problematic. And his response is, well, that's the way democracy is. And w that's perhaps one of the ways that we can uh, solve the logjam that we have. We may not like everything that comes out of it, but we'll free up some of the obstruction. W what's your view of that? There are a lot of changes I'd like to see in the Constitution, certainly. Um, many more than I would have said 15 or 20 years ago. But even 15 or 20 years ago when this issue was raised, I was extremely uneasy about it. I said, instead of a James Madison, we'd have a Phyllis Schlafly. Uh, instead of a Ben Franklin, we'd have a Michael Moore. Um, those are not the kinds of people I want making some of these difficult decisions. Now, to be sure, if you have a constitutional convention and they pass through a bunch of amendments, they still have to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. But the way we are with the states now, we have no idea what could happen. And it actually raises another one of the problems that we have, which is the campaign finance system. Uh, imagine, we've seen, uh, you could call him a radical libertarian, I think he's worse than that, Peter Thiel, one of the founders of PayPal, multi-billionaire, put $10 million in to basically create from nothing the uh, Senate candidacy of J.D. Vance. Um, and he's done it for a number of others who themselves are radical, bomb-throwing election deniers. We had somebody who just gave $1.6 billion by selling his company to Leonard Leo, who ran the Federalist Society for a long time. All of the Trump judges, including Eileen Cannon, or basically once were on the list uh, of the Federalist Society where Trump had made the pledge that those were the ones he'd put in the judiciary. Cannon, by the way, confirmed eight days after the presidential election that uh, Trump lost. Uh, imagine if Leonard Leo says, I'm gonna take that 1.6 billion and put it all into a campaign not just to get to stack the deck with the delegates to a constitutional convention, but if they pass, let's say, a constitutional amendment that takes the Second Amendment and basically removes any reference to a militia, but also says any weapons you want, any time, carry however, no uh, checks needed, and you get a massive campaign to get that added to the Constitution. I wouldn't be happy with that. And I think there's a real possibility that uh, you could see amendments that on their, even on the surface, don't seem as you know, radical as that, but have some allure to them actually making it through and getting enacted. So without having a greater assurance of who would be the delegates, uh, I would not be thrilled with the possibility of a constitutional convention. But let me say, like it or not, we're only a couple of states away from having one called. So this may be a reality uh, before you know it. Um, you know, most of what you said I've heard before, but it's amazing how it all is alarming when you weave it together like you did. It's, it's really startling. Um, we definitely need a two governing, at least two governing parties. Yeah. Two parties that are committed to actually governing. And short of a, con a constitutional convention, are there reforms that can move us in that direction, like ranked choice voting, although it seems hardly up to the task? And then I was wondering, you didn't mention, the f you did not mention the effect of social media in, yeah. in all this, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were. Um, on the latter, certainly there's no question that social media is an accelerant of some of the worst elements of this. Good as it can be, fun as it can be, I'm on Twitter a lot. I actually have uh, made a lot of terrific friends. I, half the stuff I read is things that uh, people put out there, but I know the pernicious effect that these media have. You perhaps saw uh, the, the Washington Post had a chilling story, may have even been today, about the Women's March in 2017 and how the Russians moved in and basically picked on one person who had been a small player in this, 
who happened to be uh, a Muslim woman and blew it up into something that destroyed the integrity of the whole thing. Uh, we know that foreign players play a major role here. One of the more interesting moments was uh, Facebook testified in the Senate after the 2016 election, and their top executive said, how are we to know that the Russians were doing this? And Al Franken, who was then in the Senate, said, maybe because they were paying you in rubles? Uh, so there's that part of it. Now, in terms of reforms, uh, I've actually, uh, and uh, uh, getting two parties, we cannot survive as a democracy without two functioning parties. The Republican Party, frankly, is not a functioning party now. I'll be blunt, it's more a cult. And what we see with an awful lot of people who know better, you know, when Liz Cheney said that a hundred of her colleagues came up to her afterwards and said, right on, you're absolutely right, I can't do it. It's because the fear of being shunned or excommunicated is such an overwhelming one. So people shrink back from doing the right thing. And if we had a functioning Republican Party, it would be a party as conservative as Liz Cheney. And that's really conservative. And that's fine. We need two parties that know there are problems in the society that need solving. And you can come at it from very different places. But then you can work all of that through. One thing that can make a difference, I used to believe in and still do what we call the rule of three. Party has to lose three elections in a row before it's jolted back into realizing that it's heading down a very destructive path. You lose one and it's, ah, how could we have nominated that idiot? You lose two and it's, ah, we did it again. By the third time, you recognize that it's broader than that. And part of, partly the rhythm of our midterms is such that it's hard for a party to lose three in a row. If this time, and by the way, I didn't mention another figure that's also chilling. 15 of the Republican candidates for governor are election deniers. 11 of the candidates for secretary of state, the chief election officials in states, are election deniers. 10 of the Republican candidates for attorney general, the chief law enforcement officer in the state, are election deniers. We're in a bad place. If they all lose, if they don't take the House with their expectations so high, if they lose a couple more seats in the Senate, I think you start to get some traction for the people out there who want to return to a legitimate party. But other than that, if we're going to build more legitimacy into the system, there are structural changes that we could make. I've been a part of a commission of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences we did a lengthy report called Our Common Purpose. It's online. Go to amacad.org, Our Common Purpose. And we have a whole series of things. One change I've favored for a very long time is the Australian system of mandatory attendance at the polls. Call it universal voting if you want. In Australia, you don't have to vote. But if you don't show up, you can cast a null ballot, none of the above. You're subject to a fine of about $15. They get 90% plus turnout in all of their elections. And the big difference is it's not that, you know, 90% uh, turnout conveys legitimacy. Russia has 100% turnout. Doesn't mean it's legitimate. <coughs> Chicago used to have 110%. Uh, uh, but in Australia, if you know that your base is going to be there and their base is going to be there, and you're not going to gain anything from scaring the shit out of your base or uh, you know, uh, demonizing their base. You have to aim at those persuadable voters in the middle, and it alters things. Now, I also am strongly in favor of ranked choice voting. I'd like to see it at the presidential level because I don't want more of a pernicious impact of a Pat Buchanan or a Ralph Nader or a Jill Stein where they can alter the outcome of an election even further by diverting votes. That's, there's a reason why the Russians supported Jill Stein. They knew what it would do. If there's ranked choice voting, you then have an opportunity for a third or a fourth party to emerge, for candidates to be able to make a case. But they're not going to distort the outcome of the elections. And I'd like to see it overall. And I'd also like to see repeal of the 1967 law that mandated single member districts in the House. 
Let's have some multi-member districts with ranked choice voting. For a long time, for decades, Illinois in its state legislature had three member districts. They were more heterogeneous. Voters could cast three votes for one, two for one and one for another, or one for each of three candidates. You had a broader range of candidates running. And the incentive for the candidates, unlike a uh, safe district where you're only aiming at the extreme, was to try and make sure you could get some second place votes. So it moderated the impact. Now, the other thing I'd like to see is enlarging the House. The House was effectively set at 435 in 1910, statutorily in 1929. Historians argue a little bit about this, but I think it's pretty strongly clear that the reason it was fixed is because conservative states saw this wave of immigrants coming in to Ellis Island and fanning out through the Northeast and the Midwest, you know, these dirty immigrants coming from Italy and Ireland, uh, and uh, they uh, didn't want them to have political power. And they saw all the former slave families and their uh, successors moving out of the South. And they wanted, by capping the size, they could retain their power. Uh, if we added 150 members to the House, we could, I think, accommodate it in the physical plant. But you'd move the average district size from about 800,000 to about 500,000. People could be more uh, closely represented. You'd have a harder time with those districts doing gerrymandering the way we have now. And you could experiment with multi-member districts as well. And you would dilute to some degree the distorting impact of the Electoral College uh, because you'd give somewhat more weight to the states that are gaining in population and not to the states that are losing. So, you know, right now, uh, Wyoming has 170th of the uh, population of California, but uh, 117th of the power, you know, cut it down to 112th of the power, you'd have some impact. But, you know, let's be realistic. Getting those things done is not easy. Um, and not all of them require constitutional amendments. Most of these things can be done statutorily. But also, the norm issue, the cultural problem, is still a big one. Tribalism's not going away if we make some changes here. We got a lot of work to do other than, uh, you know, uh, altering the constitution or the political structures. Uh, along that general line, uh, you had mentioned uh, that you think the crisis we have is as bad as anything we've had since the Civil War. Yeah. During the 10 years leading up to the Civil War, uh, we had a similar situation. The Whig Party had become an yeah. ineffective governing party. Yes. It essentially disappeared. And after a period of a few years and some turmoil, was replaced by this new party, the Republican Party. Do you see any chance that something like that might happen in the next 10 years? Of course, we also had the Know Nothing Party, which actually well, effectively- that, But that, that was one of the, elected of the things president. that happened yeah. along the way. Yeah. yeah. So, but the Know Nothing Party didn't disappear. It's just reemerged. Uh, yeah. no. <laughs> uh, um, it's hard to do. It's happened once. In theory, it could happen again. Um, I do believe that, you know, uh, you know I, I have a lot of friends who say, I can't be a Republican anymore. And what I tell them is, stick around. Somebody has to be there to pick up the pieces and recreate a legitimate party. Um, not all of them follow that advice, although I think they would go back. I know we also have a big problem because you have a substantial number of people who feel like they don't have a home in our political system. We make it extremely difficult to have a third party emerge, and we don't want to have them emerge in a way where they could distort the outcomes, uh, as we've talked about. You know, uh, This morning, I spoke to a group of uh, uh, retired CEOs of big companies, people I've known since when they were CEOs. Most of them 
They're lifelong Republicans. They're socially moderate, fiscally conservative. They don't feel comfortable as Democrats, but they certainly are appalled by what they've seen in the party uh, that they've been a part of. And they don't know where to go. And I certainly have some friends who are pro-life, more conservative Democrats who also don't feel like the Republican cult is where they want to be, but are more uneasy about being Democrats. There are fewer uh, who feel that way. The Democratic Party remains a, a party of coalitions. Uh, uh, and fractious as it may be, uh, it's still easier for people to stay. Um, but we don't have an easy outlet there. And I'm not sure how we can do that without, for example, creating broader ranked choice voting or moving towards some form of proportional representation. Something you've got to be very careful about. Many of the scholars that I know, Lee Drutman, who's at uh, Brookings, has created a group and he's really moving, trying to move in that direction. It would ease up a lot of the problems of representation and underrepresentation and illegitimacy. But on the other hand, when you look at some of the systems of proportional representation, like Israel, for example, you can take it too far and end up with something that can be even worse. One where a small fringe group, as we see with the ultra-religious in Israel, can have an inordinate impact, or one where people get settled in and, and frozen in place, and you can never build a, an enduring coalition to be able to govern. So you gotta be careful about how you do it, but we're far away from having that happen. Uh, Jody, do you have any uh, comments from the uh, Zoom? Yes, there was. Um, you've actually answered a few of the questions that came in um, dealing with some of the numbers and some of the reforms. But there was a question specifically about what impact adding justices to the Supreme Court could make yeah. in all of this. So uh, I do not refer to this as packing the court. Mitch McConnell packed the court. Adding justices would be restoring the court. Uh, and there's a logic to it, uh, something that Ray was talking about it, uh, earlier this evening as well. When we set on nine, and remember, we started with five. The numbers have moved, not in recent uh, decades. But there were nine circuits. Now, other than DC, there are 13 circuits. So the logic says we should have 13 justices. Uh, that's not just about you know, tilting the ideological views. It makes sense. Uh, I believe that that would be a positive development, even though it would be extraordinarily difficult to achieve. Now, I think there are other things that could be done. I'm a longtime proponent of term limits for justices. Um, you know, when the uh, framers set up the Supreme Court, one of the things they were worried about was the ability to recruit people to move into the judiciary. And it was, well, you know, if we pay them for life, then there'll be an incentive. Well, that's not much of an incentive now when if you're a partner in a law firm, you're making 10 or 20 times what uh, a Supreme Court justice makes. Uh, but it's also the case that now in our tribalized environment, the incentive is to pick somebody as young as you can possibly get because whatever happens in elections then, you're gonna have somebody in, with enormous power for decades beyond. And one of the things that, uh, that really struck me uh, back when Sam Alito was picked for the Supreme Court, one of the other possible nominees was a judge from Virginia named J. Harvey Wilkinson. Uh, J. Wilkinson, very conservative, but a classic conservative, and a classic moderate in his judicial philosophy, and a man of just impeccable integrity, sort of like a successor to Lewis Powell. He was 60, and that's the reason he wasn't chosen for the Supreme Court, too old. Now, if you had an 18-year single term, then why not pick a 60-year-old? Given where we are with life expectancy, you broaden the pool. And we now exist in a world where the actuarial tables 
mean as much as anything in terms of what president chooses Supreme Court justices. You can have a president who serves for four years and gets zero. You can have a president who serves for four years and gets three. If you have an 18-year staggered term with nine justices, and adjust it depending on the numbers, every president gets two. Then you're more likely to at least get that broader reflection of where the country is with the court. I happen to believe you could do this without a constitutional amendment. The Constitution says justice, uh, Supreme Court justices and other judges serve in time of good behavior, meaning for life. It doesn't say you have to serve on the Supreme Court. It just says you serve for life. So after 18 years, move them to an appeals court. Move them, you know, create a special appeals, appeals court. I don't care how you do it, but I think you can do it legislatively. Now, that would be challenged. I'd like to see a Supreme Court uh, decide to take up something <laughs> that reflects their own self-interest in that way. But uh, there are lots of things we can do. And I'd add one other thing, which is the Constitution gives the Supreme Court very limited original jurisdiction. Everything else that the court has has been given to it by Congress or through the process of judicial review accepted passively by Congress and the political process. The Supreme Court does not have explicitly given to it appellate authority. Congress can step in and take away much of their jurisdiction. And I will tell you that if the Supreme Court in its next term adopts this bizarre and extreme theory of the independent state legislature that they're taking up in a case in North Carolina that says that whatever the state constitution is, the state courts have no role to play in not just redistricting, but the way in which votes are counted and tabulated, anything involving racial discrimination or anything else, it's only up to the legislature, narrowly defined as the people elected to the legislature, even though the legislature is a product of the constitution of the state. If they take that perspective, which Alito hinted at with electoral votes, but now they're talking about it when it comes to state and federal elections of all sorts. If I'm Congress, I'm going to say, OK, Constitution explicitly gives that power to Congress. So the Supreme Court has no role to play. Therefore, Shelby County, Citizens United, and all their progeny are null and void. You have no right to get involved in anything that has been acted upon by Congress. Now, you need a majority to be able to do that, and you'd hate to be in a position where you get that kind of constitutional confrontation. But firing a shot across the bow of the court by saying, we can control your jurisdiction, might send them back to at least thinking about where they are and ought to be. I, I, I'll mention one other thing, if you'll indulge me. Some years ago, on the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education, um, my wife was a graduate of Yale Law School, and we were up at her reunion. And they did a panel with six clerks for justices when Brown v. Board was decided. It was one of the most fascinating things I've attended. And what became clear, remember, six of the nine justices at that point had been in elective office. Now, of course, zero, right? Earl Warren, former governor, we had former senators, we had mayor, we had people in different offices. They took two years to decide Brown v. Board. It went over two terms. And the clerks talked about how they went back and forth with the different justices. They knew that if you're going to make a decision of this import, it was going to have such an impact on the society. You wanted to do it right, but you also wanted to find a way to make it unanimous mm -hmm. so that the legitimacy would be accepted. Now, we know over decades, it's not like it worked perfectly. And there was massive resistance, and we saw all kinds of other issues. But it made a difference. Look at Dobbs in contrast. And what I would say pretty confidently is that if something like Brown v. Board had been taken up by this Supreme Court, it would have been 5-4 the other way. 
Uh, with all of your experience and background and knowledge of the people in Congress and around the country, the politicians, do you see anyone who you think would have the, the status, the expertise to become a better president, perhaps, than, than we've seen recently? So, can I, can I give one yeah. example? Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska. Um, I know Ben Sass. Uh, I'm down on Ben Sass. And the reason I'm down on Ben Sass is that he talks a lot about moderation, um, but he hasn't behaved that way. He's voted for every court nominee, and I don't just mean Supreme Court, um, but lower court nominees who were manifestly unqualified for the positions. He has, in the end, done nothing to take on Trump or the serious issues. It's part of, and it's the same disappointment I have with Lamar Alexander, uh, with, uh, I have now with Rob Portman. Um, Rob knows better. Hasn't changed even as he's retiring. Um, so it's hard for me to find, uh, it's very hard, frankly, now on the Republican side, other than, say, a Charlie Baker, the governor of Massachusetts, um, or a Liz Cheney or Adam Kinzinger. Um, there are people out of office uh, who have stepped up, and you know it's not easy. On the Democratic side, uh, there are a lot of impressive people there. We were talking earlier about somebody who I've actually grown quite close to in part because we both lost children, and that's Jamie Raskin. Um, and if you look at actually at almost all those members on the January 6th committee, they're just extraordinary uh, people. The House has a number of uh, just remarkable uh, members. And there are a number in the Senate as well who are smart and capable, um, who would probably be pretty decent as presidents. I'm not as familiar with the governors, um, but certainly there are some there. Uh, and it's a little bit easier, even on the Republican side, a governor has to be at least a little bit more pragmatic, although when I look at a Ron DeSantis or a, uh, even a uh, Nikki Haley, the former governor, I just don't see principle there. Uh, it's, it's just so hard to fight that culture and to get anywhere. Uh, so I'm you know, uh, fairly bullish on some of the young talent on the Democratic side, although uh, you know, the nightmare of a bitter and difficult uh, nomination struggle if Joe Biden doesn't run again is very troublesome, uh, especially because in the aftermath of Dobbs, if you don't nominate the woman who has been vice president, and I think she would have an uphill struggle, uh, you're going to have a real problem with the uh, uh, enthusiasm of your own uh, base. Uh, but I'm worried about the future. Uh, you know, we have a generation now, and we even have some impressive people running for the first time. Um, I'll tell you that Raphael Warnock, uh, the uh, senator from Georgia, is just an extraordinary, talented man. Uh, we have some young talent there. But what happens with Gen Z moving forward? Uh, you know, one of the things that concerns me is we have two younger generations now who have grown up through all this political turmoil, who don't have any respect for democracy or understanding of it at all because it's failed them. All they see is bickering and viciousness and an inability to act on things that matter to them. And I'm afraid that some of them might be more than willing to move towards some kind of dictatorial environment if they think it's a dictator they would like. And our civic education has failed them. You know, we had generations, we know from political socialization, that if as you're coming of age politically, you vote for a party three times in a row, that's likely to be your identity for life. But that's assuming that you vote for that party and you think it's really doing a good job. What happens if you vote three times and you think it all sucks, nothing good is coming of it, or you're gridlocked, and our expectation is, in contravention of what we know about how the political system works, 
all right, you got the reins of power. Why aren't you doing this? You know, it's hard to explain to people, well, there's Kristen Cinema, and there's Joe Manchin, um, or we can't get a single vote out of them. Don't make excuses. You got the reins of power, do something. And if they don't act, then you're gonna see people turning away from the fundamentals of the system. And whether we're gonna get the kind of talent and balance and substance we need recruited into running for office down the road, I'm just not sure. When I see with an awful lot of young people is if they're gonna throw themselves into public service, it's not gonna be an elective office. And I think we've got a challenge ahead of us and we've got to find a way to restore that sense of confidence. And let's face it, running for office now is a horrible thing. The money, the fact that your dignity is stripped away, that everything that your uh, opposition will do is to try and smear you or find bad things. You know, I remember, uh, uh, what, 20 years ago or so, uh, I was at a session where my young son participated and a number of other young people on Facebook. And you had the older generation saying, you kids are crazy. You're putting all of this stuff out there, pictures and things that you're saying. They're not going to disappear. They're going to follow you for life and they could destroy you. And their attitude was, hey, you know, by the time we're ready to be, you know, be doing a job interview or whatever, it'll be our generation. They've been through it as well. They have no understanding of what happens when suddenly your life is stripped out in front of people. And, uh, you know, even if we solve all these other problems, we're going to have to find a way to reinvigorate this sense of civic duty. One of the other things we haven't talked about but I, you know, I would put actually first time I list is national service. Uh, I really think it is absolutely urgent that we have a program of national service that you get people who have to do something for a year or two. It can be anything that serves a public interest that makes them understand first that they are a part of a larger society that they have to give something back because of all that they're getting from the society, that exposes them to people from different walks of life, that, uh, you know, the, the World War II generation, I think, came through and it altered the way they looked at the world and it, in more of a positive way than a negative way. It doesn't have to be military service, but we've got to do something to make sure that younger generations coming forward don't develop these terrible attitudes because of how we've screwed everything up. Uh, Barb, let's, uh, let's take uh, one more question. Or yeah. One more question. We have a question right here. And then we can retire to the thunder for a little refreshments and continue the conversation. Sure. I just wanted to yeah. say I, I see two rays of sunshine on the horizon, uh, Katie Porter and Stacey Abrams. And I do think women have to get in the fray and make things better. Katie Porter is uh, an amazing talent. And I will say also, if you look at Katie Porter and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and how they've used five minutes that they have to question witnesses, um, it's, it's like a master class that their <laughs> senior colleagues do not uh, understand uh, as well. Um, and uh, Stacey Abrams is certainly a force of nature. I'm skeptical that she's going to win. And a second loss, she's going to have to find a way to have a different role in public life. Um, it, maybe it will be different. Maybe Dobbs will make a difference there. What we know, uh, frankly, from uh, what we see in the polls in Georgia is part of her problem is with black men. And that's because black men seem to have a problem with black women, uh, and uh, which also is the case with white men, with women as well in many instances. I just saw a survey from Michigan um, in the governor's race. The Republican candidate is a nutcase, election-denying nutcase. And the recent poll showed that uh, Gretchen Widmer is winning women by like 59 to 38 but losing men to the nutcase like 42 to 47, 
which uh, makes me very ashamed of my gender. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe she can prevail. Unfortunately, I think Brian Kemp, who's not a good guy, um, is still relatively uh, strong there. And it'll tell you all you need to know about tribalism, that Herschel Walker, who is about as unqualified and incapable a candidate as you could find, is neck and neck with Raphael Warnock. Uh, that's what tribalism brings you. People don't look at candidates and say, uh, this is not a person qualified to serve. It's one of us or one of them. Uh, Thank you, Norm, for an absolutely amazing evening. Thank you. And um, please join us. Thank you. Uh, please join us out in the rotunda. If you all will come out, we'll have a few refreshments, continue the conversation. And uh, I'll tell you, Norm, it's, I miss the conversations we had in the old days. And you're still doing it, and it's amazing. Thank you.